Well, online courses could be a game changer for education. Never before has there been such widespread availability of educational content. Thanks to digital technology, it has never been so easy or even so cheap to learn. Joining me now in studio to talk about what is commonly referred to in education circles is MOOCs, is the State Director of Oklahoma Department of Career Tech, Robert Summers. Well, first of all, it's a term that I wasn't that familiar with. What is a MOOC? Well, the good news is most people haven't been familiar. It's that new. I think it's been about seven months since I've known it. It stands for Massive Open Online Education. It is the way an increasing volume of higher education instruction is occurring. It's digitized instruction, but it's also backed up by faculty. And in some cases, if people actually pay for the coursework, you can earn credit. Okay. So how do these differ from the telecourses that I took even as a college student? Yeah, well, it, it's really about technology changes. You know, a long time ago, we had to go somewhere to hear somebody talk, and, and we called it a classroom. Uh, then we got teleconferences or even correspondence courses, so we had the ability to ship materials or we could send tapes. Today, with the Internet, it's live, present, and instant. So I, I equate it to like banking. We used to go to the bank, and we had a teller take care of our business. Then they have an ATM, so I physically go someplace. I have to do my business at an ATM machine instead of a teller. Well, now I have mobile apps that I can deposit my, mo my money by taking pictures of it. I can read all my uh, bank statements online. I don't have to go anywhere. I can be anywhere to do that. Well, that's what MOOCs are. You can literally be anywhere, and all the content and all the instruction is delivered to you on your time, on your place, and at your pace. And I want to ask you about that at your pace. Does that mean the traditional year we may spend taking a class may be brought down or could be expanded if we didn't get the information? Right. Time really has no meaning anymore. It still has a lot of meaning in institutions like schools and colleges. But increasingly, uh, with the technology that we have available, we no longer have to have the tyranny of the cohort. We don't have to rely on somebody scheduling a time and we go and visit them directly. Not that we can't do that still, but, but for the most part, we don't need to. People can personalize their learning. There's an awful lot of uh, young people and adults alike that can learn things very, very quickly. They can learn to proficiency, prove proficiency, and move on. Credit isn't based on how many hours or weeks you spend in a course. Uh, the course content is presented and you get credit based on actual skill sets, actual proof of competence. So time in the seat may not be as important anymore. Uh, seat, seat time is actually a leftover of the previous generation's education. In, in the purest sense, when we combine digital instruction with high quality faculty, we actually eliminate time as a, a factor at all. And oddly enough, it actually makes the teacher much more professional. For the first time in history, we now have the ability for teachers to move from being the presenter of information to being the facilitator of instruction, the problem solver for the student, building relationships with the students, creating opportunities for students to succeed rather than grading papers all night. Yeah. Uh, that, that makes a big difference, and we can build school settings where the teachers or a team of teachers can actually change how the, the work occurs on a daily basis, not once a year or in a committee or based on some board uh, edict. Mm -hmm. What about cost? Technology is certainly not free. Uh, actually, technology is surprisingly free. Okay. If you think about it, the Internet is basically there. Uh, there, you know, somebody had to spend money on it, but now that it's in place, the cost of communications is virtually zero. Now, I maybe date myself. I remember the old landlines. You know, you paid twenty-five, thirty dollars a, a month simply for the ability to talk auditorily. Now, for twenty-five, thirty dollars a month, I can get my movies, my TV. I can get texting, email all kinds of entertainment, and I can talk on the phone. So it has gone to almost nothing. The other is the proliferation of internet uh, devices, smartphones, iPads, laptops, means that nearly everybody has access to the technology. On the other side, once I develop a lesson and I digitize it, 
sending it to you costs me nothing in additional cost. So I can, I can prepare a lesson for 10 students or I can deliver it to 140,000 for exactly the same price. So in a way, it actually is free. So if it's cheaper and then certainly more convenient for both teachers and the, the students, why aren't we seeing more of these MOOCs, these online courses? Uh, it's called tradition. <laughs> and, and it's called uh, basically a typical response to what we call disruptive innovation. Uh, Clayton Christensen wrote a great book, Disrupting Class. And basically you find this not only in the education industry, but any industry. For example, IBM mainframes. The only way they transitioned to desktops was to create a separate company. The mainframe folks could not figure out how to use a desktop computer or to make it effective. In education, what we have is an entire industry an entire instructional methodology, an entire understanding where there's a teacher, there's a classroom, and there's a cohort of students. And that is very difficult to transition away from that to a place where the student's in the center. Proficiency is the currency rather than time, and the teacher becomes a high quality professional that's, manu that's managing that process. So is there a role for employers to play in trying to move us to where you think that we need to go? Well, employers and society will ultimately make this transition necessary. Parents on the one side, because they want their children to succeed and they want their children to have choices in how they learn and they see the proliferation. It, for example, students in high school no longer have to wait for college to take college courses. MOOCs allow them to take them anytime they want. So think of that whole range. But employers are increasingly interested in talent, not credentials and in the traditional sense. They're interested in credentials that are tied to specific skill sets. Rackspace needs coders to keep the cloud alive. They're not really interested in whether the student is a high school graduate even, a college graduate. They care whether they can code, whether they show up, deliver high quality service. Employers are increasingly finding that. Uh, that's the reason you see an increased expectation for industry credentials. Site Selection Magazine now uses industry credentials in equivalent settings with college degrees in measuring the workforce quality for choosing where you put your company. So I think it'll emerge more and more. The companies will drive a lot of this change because they'll hire the people with the talent, not just the people that sat there for four years and went through courses. Well, I, I appreciate the, the insight and thank you so much for being here. Now we have much more on education reform on our website. There I have a conversation with three university presidents to talk about some of the challenges they now face. Plus, Elisa Hines has a blog on what it's like to have two kids in college at the same time. Just head to okhorizon.com where you can see them both.